And we got a 2019 Hyundai Accent here. Just got towed in. You know that's a good sign, right? Anyway, so I talked to the owner uh, a few weeks ago and she said, hey, my son's car, which is the Hyundai, needs a tune-up. She said when he comes to a stop sign and he goes to accelerate, it's very sluggish to accelerate, but eventually gets there, right? And I'm like, yeah, I don't think a tune-up's going to fix that. But they want to get a tune-up done because apparently nothing has been done to it since it was brand new. So uh, they just want to get it done and they figure while it's here, you know, I could look at it. But they were hoping that the tune-up would fix this problem. And then about a week later, she contacts me again saying, hey, now he's telling me that the car won't go over 80 miles per hour, which, I mean, speed limit 65, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so it won't go past 80. So we have two symptoms going on here. It's sluggish, doesn't want to take off from a stop very quickly, and now it doesn't want to go over 80 miles per hour. So I'm not going to try to replicate that. Uh, the whole 80 mile per hour thing because I don't drive customers' cars like that. Like I said, they wanted to get tune up done, so we got new parts here. We have just some basic stuff, guys, nothing crazy. We got an air filter, set of spark plugs, cabin air filter, PCV valve, and a serpentine belt. Like I said, again, nothing major, just basic tune up stuff. You know what? Let's go out for a test drive first. Um, I'm noticing there's no check engine light. So it seems like we have a car that has problems, but not enough to throw a check engine light. Hmm, maybe a clogged catalytic converter. They will do that. They will restrict how fast you could drive the car if the catalytic converter is restricted and it will not set a check engine light. We've experienced all of this stuff on my sister's Hyundai, is it a Tucson or a Santa Fe? I can't remember what car she has. Uh, but I got videos on that car fixing this pretty much same exact symptoms on her car. So I'll put a card in the top right hand corner right here. Anyone who's interested in watching that whole series, it's like three or four videos. But let's go out for this test drive. So far, that acceleration felt normal. Yeah, I'm not feeling any problem as far as this car accelerating. Let's get on this uh, straight right here and do a hard acceleration. I did hear a rattle coming from underneath the car. And I've heard that before on my sister's Hyundai. Again, same exact symptoms. So let's see, pedal to the metal. Well, here's the thing. It was sluggish at first, but that was the transmission trying to drop into gear. Once it dropped into the lower gear, it went just fine. Even though we have no check engine light, let's go back to the garage and we'll do a full scan and see if any history codes pop up or something like that. In case anyone is wondering, we are at 91.856. I just did a full system scan and as you can see, fault codes zero, absolutely nothing. Everything is normal on this car. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this report. As far as diagnosing whether we have a restricted catalytic converter, what I'm going to do is put my pressure gauge on the upstream oxygen sensor port. So I have to pull out that oxygen sensor. But because I just drove the car around, you know, like two blocks, the exhaust manifold gets hot pretty fast. Uh, so we're gonna let this sit for a little while and we'll just go ahead and take care of this uh, tune-up because it's getting the parts uh, regardless. You know, the owner wants it done. This is a 1.6 liter. <laughs> I know this because it says it right there on the tag. So, <laughs> um, so go ahead and peel this crap off. I got the four spark plugs removed. This is just one of the new ones to compare. And I'm not liking what I'm seeing here, but I'm not surprised. This is typical Hyundai crap, especially number four. Look at this, look at how just wet and completely caked with oil and carbon. Typical Hyundai stuff. I see this all the time and uh, it's not great guys And this is the main reason on why we steered away from Hyundai and Kia Because initially we were gonna like get rid of our Nissans and we were gonna get a Hyundai or a Kia because it's kind of hard to beat Number one, they're reasonable prices and number two uh, You know a hundred thousand mile ten-year warranty You can't really beat that right until I start seeing these issues pop up on these engines and it's just so super common that it has steered us away from Hyundai and Kia, and this is another example. I'm not surprised to see this stuff. Okay, it's unfortunate, but number four looks the worst. You can see it actually looks wet with oil. And here's the thing, it's gonna get the new spark plugs, and it, it might help the way this thing drives, right? 
because you're going to get better ignition going on inside the cylinder. But this problem is going to come back and it only comes back worse and it gets worse over time. Oil is getting into the combustion chamber and that's usually due to like blow by um, oil getting past the piston rings and then they start to gum up and they're no longer sealing. You get low compression and then you get more blow by, more oil, and then the oil starts to foul out the spark plugs, rinse and repeat. It's a vicious cycle and that's just the nature of these engines. I've seen it so many times before. At this point, I'm debating on whether I want to put in all this work to remove that upstream oxygen sensor, which is back there hopefully you guys can see it because it is a decent amount of work to get it out especially if it doesn't want to come out i'm going to be fighting with it only to get in there and put my pressure gauge on it and to realize there's no problem here it definitely doesn't feel like there's a problem because when a catalytic converter is restricted there is no oh it's working now and oh now it's not working it's working now no it's if it's restricted it's restricted end of story um, and during my test drive, I didn't feel that. The car felt like it was accelerating fine. I gotta think about it. I don't know if I wanna bark up that tree. It'll be a lot of extra labor for nothing. So I got the first three spark plugs installed and I figured since the last one, number four, looked pretty bad and nasty, gunked up with oil. Let's go in there with the camera. I got it all set up here and let's see what it looks like inside that cylinder. I'm expecting to see a pretty nasty mess inside of there. All right, so we're just feed this inside of here. Some of you may recognize this. It's like coming out the womb again to the great beyond. So as you can see, there was a little bit of oil pulling up on top of the piston. Not great, right? And then when we looked up at the valves, um, I want to say those were the intake valves that look pretty nasty because I could see where the fuel injector would go. And obviously that's on the intake side. Uh, so the exhaust valves looked pretty dry and the intake valves looked really nasty and cruddy. Um, again, a ton of oil getting into that cylinder. And it's just what I often see on these Hyundais. Anyway, so that was pretty interesting to see all of that, right? Uh, let me go ahead and put the spark plug in it and continue with the rest of the stuff I have to install. Spark plugs are all done. All that stuff is torqued down. Good to go. Uh, we got a brand new OEM air filter. And this one's looking pretty well spanked. And what's funny is it does say Hyundai and Kia right there. And I got a feeling this car has never been to the dealer for anything. So this may be a 91 thousand mile <laughs> air filter who knows uh but either way it's got a new one and after this we'll move on to the cabin air filter after doing the spark plug they just wanted to do something simple um another thing you know how i mentioned in the test drive how there was some hesitation at first but then it picked up and that was me noticing that the transmission had to downshift that was the hesitation so i don't know the service interval for the transmission on this thing but at ninety one thousand, i'd say this thing at least should have had two different services on it um, so it's most likely running on the original trans fluid. So 91,000 miles on it. You know, that might be something to suggest to the owner. We got to get this glove box down. And I took the cover off already for the cabin air filtering, guys. That's looking pretty nasty already. Again, you can see it says Kia on it, Hyundai original filter. 91,000 miles. Let's see what this science experiment looks like. Probably should be wearing gloves. Oh, this is pretty bad. This is a bad air filter. This might be contestant for spot number one of 2023 of the worst cabin air filter. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> Let's get the new one to compare. That's one heck of a different. <laughs> Let's look at the back side of this filter. It looks real good back here. This filter is doing its job. God bless its soul. This poor little thing. <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead, pop the new one in, and uh, get rid of this science experiment. That thing's growing legs. It's about to walk away. So the condition of the old cabin air filter just reinforces my theory that this car has never been to the dealer for anything because we're seeing an OEM cabin air filter come out of it, OEM air filter, and we all know that whenever you go to a dealer for anything, they're always quick to recommend an air filter and a cabin air filter because it's super easy and quick for them to do, and they get to charge you $80 for putting on 
a cabin air filter. So yeah, this thing's never been to a dealer for anything. And this circles right back around to that transmission fluid that we know has 91,000 miles on it. So I got the old belt off of it and I don't see any cracks in it, but the rubber feels very dry rotted. And guys, remember that leads to child support. So not good. All right, kick that to the curb and let's slap the new belt on it. The new belt is installed. Everything's looking real good. Here goes the old PCV valve. The new one's already installed. It goes right here. It's right underneath this little uh, cover. So this one kind of moves. You could hear it rattling back and forth, but not much. The new one moves a lot more than this one. So uh, yeah, that just happens from carbon buildup and crap getting inside of there. So it's a good thing we got that changed. I pulled off the air intake box one more time. And to me it looks like you could use a throttle body cleaning. You guys could see the corner of it right there. So it doesn't look horrible, but you know, if it's here for maintenance, might as well go ahead and clean out the throttle body. So I'll talk to the owner and see if they want to get that done. So we're back to this Hyundai. I went in the house, had a cup of Joe. That Joe guy, he's one slippery person. I'll tell you what, he uh, he always lands me right in the toilet. I don't know about you, but he does that to me. <laughs> uh, so the car's been sitting long enough and I'm going to attempt to remove that upstream oxygen sensor. Uh, the car has been sitting, so everything uh, should be decent enough as far as it cooling off. And this is just another example of me needing to buy a pressure transducer. You know, I could easily get this information to see if the catalytic converter is restricted just by pulling out a spark plug, put the transducer in and use my scope to get that information. Uh, the thing is, guys, I've just been slacking and, you know, I'm just, I don't want to bite the bullet on the price. You know, they're over $300 and that's on the low side. And that's if I get one from Ivan over at Pine Hollow Auto Diagnostics. If you get like an actual name brand one, they're even more expensive, but there's no denying time that a tool like that can save you because here I am dealing with this type of crap of having to remove a upstream oxygen sensor just to get some information that I could have easily done, you know, while one of the spark plugs is out. So I started to unplug the connector for the oxygen sensor. And then I realized I saw this over here. I'm like, hold on, what's going on? <laughs> so I'm sure some of you were yelling at the screen that that's the wrong oxygen sensor. And sure enough, that's the downstream. That's the one, that's the one I was thinking I had to remove, but the upstream is actually right here on the side. Slightly easier, so I'm happy about that. As you can see, I got this end unplugged already. So let's see if it comes out. I got the upstream oxygen sensor out, as you can see. Came off super easy, barely an inconvenience. And I got my back pressure tester installed. You can see it down there. So I'm using the Wacon back pressure tester BPT02. And basically, once you start up the engine, we should see pretty much zero PSI in here. And then we're going to rev it up. And again, even when you rev up the engine, it should move a little bit, but not much. If you see the needle rise during idle and then go even higher during a, uh, you know, like full throttle, then that's a serious problem. So let's go ahead and start her up. So you don't want to leave that thing running for too long because the heat from the exhaust manifold will actually start to melt your tool. All right, so what we just saw on the gauge here was absolutely normal. At idle, it was like one PSI at most, and it was just kind of vibrating around, which is normal. And then when I raised the RPM, it really didn't do anything um, crazy. If you want to see a perfect example of an actual restricted catalytic converter, go check out the video that I just mentioned to you guys at the beginning of this video. Uh, the card I put in the top right hand corner about my sister's Hyundai. In those videos, I did the same exact test and you'll see a clear difference on what we just saw right here versus her car. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead, put the upstream oxygen sensor back on the car. We know it's not an issue anymore and that's rolled out. Now, as far as... um. You know, what's causing this, hey, it won't drive over 80 miles per hour? I don't know. I'm not seeing any signs of anything like that here. And all we could do is test things and kind of cross them off the list as we go. Like I said, no check engine light, no codes for anything. And the car seemed to accelerate just fine to me. Um, so maybe it's just due for maintenance. Who knows? So the oxygen sensor is reinstalled and everything is put back together. I just got to put the cover on top of the engine. I decided to check the oil. Okay, so you can see I just cleaned it off with the towel, right? Let's reinsert it all the way down, pull it out, and tell me what do you guys see? 
If you see nothing, you're absolutely correct. There's no oil in this thing. <laughs> uh, my car won't go over 80 miles per hour. Hmm. So, you need the oil change. And uh, that is an emergency. Once again, you can see it's dipped in there. I'll pull it out. I'm not joking, guys. Absolutely nothing on this dipstick. It doesn't mean there's not a single drip of oil inside the engine. It just means there's not enough to register on the dipstick, which is alarming within itself. So I popped off both of the front wheels just to check the brakes. And those pads look almost brand new. Look at them. That's a thick bore right there. So <laughs> someone has recently pad slapped this thing. The rotors, of course, look original. You can see all the corrosion on them. And it doesn't look like anyone's ever been in here. You can see the retaining screw on the rotor. So yeah, original rotor and someone recently pad slapped it. That's fine. I just want to make sure that, you know, getting close to 100,000 miles, that the pads weren't like super thin on this thing, but it's all set. The rear end has uh, drum brakes on it, so I'm not concerned with that at the moment. Uh, I'm noticing that the tires are already down to the wear indicator. So maybe for summer, you know, we're in summer right now pretty much. Um, these will be fine, but come winter, these are not going to cut it. This thing's going to be all over the road. So I'll let them know about that as well. All right, so it's actually the next day and I finally got the green light to do an oil change. So let me go ahead, pull this in. We'll get this thing knocked out. I got to move all this stuff out the way. You could see I was busy last night. Uh, I'm actually building a, I don't know what to call it. It's like a rack for firewood or a firewood shack. I don't, I don't know what to call it, guys. But you guys get the concept, right, of what I'm trying to build. So I'm just using, like, reclaimed wood from a, a pallet that we had laying around here. And then whatever, just, like, wood that we really don't need, we were going to end up burning it anyway. So I'm just trying to uh, piece together whatever I can to get this thing made. So I just pulled the drain plug out this thing. Look how much oil came out this thing. It's nothing. It's like not even a quarter of a quart. Isn't that crazy? So when I said earlier, oh, it has oil in it. It's just not enough to register on the dipstick. That was false. This thing literally has no oil in it. This is crazy. This is probably the worst I've ever seen as far as a car driving with no oil. Because usually, you know, you'll get like... Maybe one cord out of a car or something, you know, like low like it. But this is nothing. This is just drips. Absolutely crazy. There you go. Drink up, little buddy. You've been deprived of oil. What a shame. All right, so this thing is pretty much full. Let's do one final check. I already started up the engine once to get oil flowing into the oil filter. And, of course, that's going to drop the level of the oil just a little bit. That's why I turned it on. And now we can check it and top it off. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but that oil line is just a hair past the full mark. Looks good to me. So looking at the container of oil right here, this thing took, let's see. So this would be one quart. So it took a little bit over four quarts of oil to fill it up. Let's grab the oil that came out of it. We'll pour it into a container and see how much came out. So this is a container I drained the oil into and you can see it's pretty much empty. The only thing that's in there is just like residue of the old oil. And I'll tell you what, that thing was super black and it's like sludgy. Anyway, I got a quart of oil right here and we have 300 milliliters of what came out of this engine. So if you look at the scale, that's roughly about a quarter of a quart. That's absolutely crazy. This engine took about four quarts to fill up and we took a quarter of a quart out of this thing that's crazy it blows my mind how people just don't take care of their things nowadays and they just let them go to waste because that's exactly where this engine is heading to if the owner continues i mean we don't know if the damage has already been done i'm not seeing any uh, glitter or sparkles inside of the oil that did come out but needless to say this engine isn't going to last very long if the owner continues uh, the way he treats this car. I've done all I can. I did everything it came here for. And uh, that's it. As far as the 80 miles per hour thing that I didn't want to go over, I'm not going to test that. But I got a pretty good feeling that that issue should be fixed. Because you got to figure, this thing probably has like variable valve timing and all that uh, fancy crap, right? All that stuff needs oil pressure to work. And if you have no oil in your engine, well, guess what? You have no oil pressure for all those, uh, you know, complicated systems to work. So 
I got a pretty good feeling the car is going to be driving uh, just like normal when he gets it back now that it's full of oil. Anyway, that's going to be it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. And like always, thanks for watching. Here's some bonus footage for you guys wondering about the thing I was making. Here's where I'm at. I think it looks pretty dang good for being made out of uh, scrap wood and just whatever I had laying around and also a pallet. Not too bad, right? It is going to get a roof, but I don't have the type of wood around here that I want to use. And we're going to put shingles on it. And the whole thing is going to get painted to withstand being outside. But I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. And I think it's going to hold firewood just fine. Thank you.